All right, everybody, welcome back to Trevor Wallace's videos from Miss Jones period six AP physics class. And today to wrap up magnetism and electromagnetism, we're going to be discussing Maxwell's equations. So what are Maxwell's equations? Maxwell's equations that we're going to be talking about in the integral form today are a set of equations, four equations, that basically describe the interactions between electric and magnetic fields. So let's get right into it. The first of Maxwell's equations that we're going to be discussing today is called Gauss's law. <clears throat> Gauss's law for electric flux. We're going to denote electric flux with the symbol phi e. This is electric flux. So let's examine a situation where we have, let's say, a positive uh, electrically charged particle right here in empty space. So what we know from our electric field lines is that this positive charged particle is going to have electric field lines emanating from it in a sphere. They're going to be pointing away from the positively charged particle. If it were a negatively charged particle, they would be pointing towards it. So now what we want to do is find this concept of electric flux. So the best way that we can think about electric flux is how much how much of an electric field is penetrating a surface. So this surface is purely imaginary. We're going to we're going to create our own imaginary closed surface in space and we're going to examine how much electric field is penetrating this surface. So, let's start by putting our imaginary closed surface, our imaginary closed sphere, let's say right here. And what we see is that there are electric field lines that go through the sphere here and go through the sphere here go through the sphere here, exit the sphere here. And what we're gonna see is that when we put our, our, our sphere here in, in empty space, away from the charged particle, uh, there's gonna be a perfect balancing act between the sphere lines that go in, or the electric field lines that go into the sphere and go out of the sphere. So what we're gonna say is that in this scenario, our electric flux equals zero. So now let's examine another scenario, let's say, where we put our sphere around our charged particle. Now what we're going to see is that these field lines are going out, these are going out, these are going out, these are going out. All of our electric field lines are pointing out of our closed surface. And now what we can say is because all of our field lines are pointing out of our closed surface, our net electric flux is going to be positive. If this were a negatively charged particle instead, then all of our electric field lines would be pointing inwards and we would say that we have a negative electric flux. But here, our electric flux is greater than zero. So. Gauss's law is going to let us uh, quant quantize this concept of electric flux. Gauss's law, we can say that electric flux is equal to our closed loop integral, which that is denoting this closed surface, our imaginary closed surface here, our closed loop integral of our electric field, which is a vector quantity, dotted with our dA, which we're also taking as a vector because we're only looking at the perpendicular components of our electric field, in this case, they're all here at that 90 degree angle, but we're dotting with our dA vector. And what we can say is that our electric flux here, our, our closed loop integral of E dot dA is going to be equal to our enclosed charge, Q enclosed, divided by epsilon naught, which is a constant. And this is going to always be true, but it's really only useful with symmetric objects, Gauss's law of electric flux. But what Gauss's law of electric flux tells us is this right here. And this is our first of Maxwell's equations. So now let's talk about Gauss's law for magnetism. This is Maxwell's second equation, Gauss's law for magnetic flux. So now let's examine a similar situation as we did with our charged particle. But instead of a charged particle, let's examine a magnet, a bar magnet here with a north pole and a south pole. Our magnetic field lines are gonna behave very similar to our electric field lines. And then they're gonna go out of the north pole and into the south pole like this. So now let's try the same thing that we did to try and define our quantity that is our magnetic flux, our phi sub b. So let's place our, our closed surface, say over here in the field. And what we're gonna see is the same thing that we just saw with our electric field. The lines that are pointing in are exactly balancing the lines that are pointing out. So in this first scenario, our phi b is going to be equal to zero. So now let's try basically what we just did with the electricity example, where now let's try circling the entire magnet and see if this makes a change in what we can calculate for our, our phi sub b. But now what we're gonna see is up here at the north pole, these lines are gonna be pointing outwards, and down here at the south pole, these lines are gonna be pointing inwards. And what we're gonna see is the exact same balancing act that we just saw, and that our phi b on this closed surface is also going to equal zero. 
So now at this point you're saying, oh, like I got this now, like I, I know how to do this. I'm just gonna circle just the North Pole. And now I only, I only, have, I only have these lines pointing outward. So now I have a, a positive magnetic flux. But where you're forgetting is that these magnetic field lines continue through the magnet. And what we're gonna see again is that on this closed surface, our 5B, our magnetic flux is gonna exactly balance out and we're gonna have our 5B equal to zero again. And this is gonna be true for any situation, any closed surface that we can put in this magnetic field, our closed loop integral of our magnetic field dotted with DA, which is equal to our magnetic flux, is always going to equal zero. And what does this teach us? This teaches us that there are no, oh, that there are no magnetic monopoles. You cannot have just a North Pole with no South Pole. This does not happen in magnetism. You can't have a South Pole with no North Pole. And if I were to break this magnet in half, I would not get a North Pole and a South Pole. I would get two new magnets that each have their own North Pole and South Pole. And so this is what Gauss's law for magnetic flux tells us, is that the closed loop integral over a closed surface of our magnetic field dotted with DA is always going to equal zero. So now that we've got through the first two coupled uh, Maxwell's equations for our, our two laws of, of flux, for electric flux and magnetic flux, now we're gonna talk about Faraday's law of induction. And this is going to kind of begin where we're going to start about start talking about uh, induction between electric and magnetic fields. So let's examine a situation where we have a loop made of some conducting material. So this is a conducting loop. And we're going to place this conducting loop in a magnetic field. So these are our magnetic field lines. Let's just say that it's pointing upwards. So this is our magnetic field. It's directed upwards. Uh, we'll say that our, our circle has a radius of R, and we'll say that we can call each little bit of this surface uh, DL going around it. And then by our right-hand rule, because our magnetic field is pointing upwards, we know that our electric field is going to be is going to be going, I guess, clockwise around the circle. So what we know from Faraday's law of induction is that if our magnetic field is constant, then we have no induced current. However, if we have a changing magnetic field, we have a, a dB dt, now we have a changing current. And so, or, or at least a changing magnetic flux, not necessarily a changing magnetic field, but a changing magnetic flux. So what Faraday's law of induction is going to tell us is that the closed loop integral of our electric field dotted now with dL is going to be equal to the negative time rate of change, negative d by dt, of phi b, our magnetic flux, okay? And we know, just from our other equations, that our magnetic flux is equal to b times a. That's basically from our, our last equation. And we can say that in this scenario, the area of this, of this circle here is gonna be equal to pi r squared. So we can say that our magnetic flux is equal to b times pi r squared. So now let's try and simplify this a little bit more. We know that our closed loop integral of E dotted with DL on our circular path is gonna be equal to E times the circumference, which is also going to be equal to E times two pi r. And we know that this is going to be equal to the negative d by dt of phi sub b. We also know from our equations that our potential difference is equal to our electric field times distance. This is our potential difference equation. And in this scenario, our distance around our circle is 2 pi r. And because e times d equals voltage, and here we have e times d, we know that our voltage is going to be equal to negative d by dt of our magnetic flux. And we know also that our voltage is gonna be equal to our electromotive force. So this tells us that our electric, electromotive force is gonna be equal to the negative time rate of change of our magnetic flux. And this is also known as Lenz's law. Lenz's law. So now the question that you may be asking yourself is why is there a negative sign here? Why is there a negative sign here? We know that the direction of our current 
our induced EMF is going to cause a current and the current is going to make its own B field or a current is going to make its own magnetic field. And this magnetic field is going to oppose a change just like we just found out with our, our E equals negative D by DT of phi sub B. Lenz's law. And because of our right hand rule, this is going to be a reactionary force and it's going to oppose a change. So that is why we have a negative sign there. It's very similar to the, the negative sign that we have in our, our spring constant equation, F equals negative KX, and that this is an oppositional force that's gonna oppose a change. So now we're gonna look at the fourth and final of Maxwell's equations, it's known as Ampere's law. And Ampere's law helps us define the magnitude and direction of a magnetic field. And what Ampere's law tells us, I'm just going to tell us straight off the bat, is that our closed loop integral of our magnetic field dotted with dl now is going to be exactly equal to mu naught, which is a constant, times our penetrating current, the current that penetrates our Amperean loop. So let's examine a scenario where we have uh, a couple current carrying wires. Let's put, let's put four of them. Let's say this one is going downwards, this one's going up, this one's going up, this one's going down. And we'll label all of them. This is I1, I2, I3, I4. And let's say that we want to define a closed loop, our Amperian loop, that we're just going to pick randomly. This is a random conceptual imaginary loop that we're just going to place in space. So let's say that we want to put it here. And what we can see, obviously, is that uh, using our right-hand rule, let's define our DL to be in this direction. Uh, what we see is that our penetrating current, I pen, is going to be equal to I2, which is positive based on our right-hand rule, plus I3. And then based on our right-hand rule, current 4 is going to be negative minus I4. That is our penetrating current. We don't care about current 1 because it is not penetrating our Amperian loop. So our first step in this process is to choose a loop and direction. In general, you're going to want to do this in a way that helps you capitalize on the symmetry of the problem. But for right now, we just want to choose a loop and direction. Then we want to do what we just did, which is find our penetrating current. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use Ampere's law to find B field. Let's look at an example. Let's say here we have a current carrying wire that is pointing out of the page. We'll put that dot there. Let's say it has a current of I. And let's define our Amperian loop to be a circle around it like this. We'll say our DL is this, and we'll say that this has a radius of R, capital R. So what Ampere's law tells us is that the closed loop integral of our magnetic field dotted with our DL is going to be equal to mu naught, which is a constant, times our penetrating current. In this case, because we have a perfect circle, we know that our closed loop integral of B dot DL is going to be equal to B times 2 pi R, which is the circumference of the circle mu naught is a constant, and our penetrating current is just I. So this is simple. We can say by rearranging that our magnetic field is equal to mu naught times I divided by 2 pi R. And, and that is how we find our magnetic field using Ampere's law. So now let's say that we zoom way in on our current carrying wire. Uh, we say that it has a current of I. And now let's define our Amperian loop to be on the inside of this wire. We'll say that this is our, our, our Amperian loop. We'll give it a radius of R, and we'll give this our tiny little length DL. And so now we want to find what our penetrating current is. So what we, what we know here is if we have that little radius R and our, our bigger radius R of the whole wire, we know that our penetrating current divided by the current of the wire, this ratio, is going to be equal to pi r squared, the area of our small circle, divided by pi big r squared, the area of the whole surface of the wire. We can rearrange this to say that our penetrating current is equal to the current in the wire times r squared divided by big r squared. So now we can apply the same thing with Ampere's law to say that the closed loop integral of our magnetic field dotted with a DL is equal to mu naught times I penetrating. In this case, we have the same circle going on. So our B dot DL is going to be equal to B times two pi R. And we're going to set this equal to mu naught. And then our I penetrating is I times small R squared over big R squared. We can rearrange this again to find our magnetic field, which is going to be equal to mu naught 
times i times r divided by 2 pi big R squared. However, this equation for Ampere's law, b dot dl equals mu naught times i penetrating, is not Maxwell's fourth equation because we failed to add one special term. We forgot to remember that a changing electric flux produces a magnetic field in the same way that a changing magnetic flux produces an electric field. So what we're gonna have to add here is this fact that b dot dl is also equal mu naught times epsilon naught, which are two constants, times our time rate of change of electric flux. And we know that our electric flux is gonna be equal to, sorry, our electric flux is going to be equal to the uh, closed loop integral of our electric field dotted with dA. So we have to add this new term, this displacement current in some way, because there are combined of effects of our electric current and our changing electric field on our magnetic field. So what we say using the Ampere Maxwell law is that our conduction current is gonna be equal to, is this mu naught I penetrating term. And our displacement current is this mu naught epsilon naught times the time rate of change of electric flux. And therefore, Maxwell's fourth equation actually tells us that our closed loop integral of B dot DL is going to be equal to mu naught times I penetrating, our conduction current plus mu naught times epsilon naught times the time rate of change of electric flux. And this is Maxwell's fourth equation, the Ampere-Maxwell law. So to recap, Maxwell's four equations. First, we have Gauss's law for electric, electric flux. And what this tells us is that the electric flux through a closed surface is proportional, electric flux through a closed surface is proportional to the total charge that is enclosed by that surface. And if there's no charge enclosed by that surface, then we are not going to have an electric flux. Gauss's sec or Maxwell's second equation, Gauss's law, Gauss's law for magnetic flux is going to tell us that the magnetic flux through a closed, a closed surface is always going to equal zero. B dot dA is always gonna equal zero. What does this tell us? This tells us that there are no magnetic monopoles. Now we're down to our second pair of Maxwell's equations. Faraday's law of induction. And this is gonna tell us that a changing magnetic field Changing a magnetic field with respect to time, or changing magnetic flux, rather. This is an, an open surface integral, by the way. Uh, is going to induce an electromotive force in a loop of wire. So our negative time rate of change of our magnetic flux is going to equal our electromotive force because a changing magnetic flux produces an electric field. And the direction of the current is going to create a magnetic field that opposes the change of magnetic flux, which is why we have this negative sign. And finally, Maxwell's fourth equation, the Ampere Maxwell law, is going to tell us that a changing electric flux is going to produce a magnetic field. B dot dl is going to equal mu naught times our enclosed current plus our displacement current or mu naught times I enclosed or I penetrating is going to equal mu naught epsilon naught times the time derivative of our electric flux E dot DA. And now Maxwell's equations were extremely important. They predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. They allowed us to define the concepts of electricity and magnetism and the manner in which electromagnetic waves interact. 
and they basically set the foundation for, for modern electromagnetism and electric and magnetic physics. Make sure to demolish that like button and absolutely obliterate the subscribe button and make sure to ding that bell. Otherwise, James Clerk Maxwell is going to come electrocute you in your sleep. Don't forget to leave a like in this video and hit that follow button.